Calderon Lüning and I'm a researcher at the Weizenbaum Institute together with the research group Inequality and Digital Sovereignty. And today I'm giving a workshop which is called the Manifesto for the Data City. And what we're trying to do in this workshop is to get away from, more, from the technological point of view and look more at the values and desires that we have uh, and the needs that we see that our city has to live up to for the next 25 years. And hopefully with that kind of mindset, we can then return to the question of technology and make a more value-based um, proposition for a technological city. Hi everybody, I'm Salvatore. I'm a social psychologist and part of Tracking Exposed team. And today with Disruption Lab, we have done a workshop about the personalization and uh, polarization of YouTube uh, algorithm. And we try to break and smash the filter bubble of YouTube uh, comparing our personalization uh, using tracking exposed tool and we found that searching the same the same word on YouTube and the word was Berlin we get really different uh, recommended videos and this shows us how uh, the perception for example of a city can be shaped by uh, an algorithm for example of YouTube uh, hi, I'm Leonardo. I'm a PhD student. Uh, I study social media analysis from a linguistic perspective. I'm also part of Tracking Expos and I was uh, running this workshop with my colleague Salvatore. Tracking Expos is actually part uh, of a more broader research uh, project that is on many more platforms. We are doing analysis on Facebook, Amazon, uh, YouTube indeed, and also on Pornhub. And what we do is to collect evidence of algorithmic personalization. I personally, I do this uh, on the linguistic perspective, so doing, doing natural language processing and stuff related to linguistic analysis. My name is River Honer, and today at the Disruption Network Labs, I hosted a workshop called Mapping Control, where we um, started by introducing general topics about geographic and spatial data analysis and visualization. We also got introduced to the data set that I collected about um, the ticket controller locations on the U-Bahn and S-Bahn network. And afterward, we teamed up to work on this map behind me to come up with more interesting visualizations. And we also talked on a higher level about the interest of creating a free public transport system and how to use data to make a compelling policy argument for that. So my name is Filippi. I am a PhD researcher uh, just arriving in Berlin. My research topic is smart cities, and I'm particularly trying to understand what is the potential for reuse materials in contemporary cities. The theme of the workshop today was to understand what the feasibility is for creating a data set of reuse and how could that inform decisions that are made in smart city projects. All right, so. We're now really at the end of our long Data Cities weekend, and uh, thanks all for still being with us. So in this final session, we just wanted to have a, a sharing on what has been happening in the four workshops that were happening today. And we're not completely going to follow the workshops from one to four, because maybe Felipe can be with us until the very end. So we thought to start actually with Felipe reporting on what happened upstairs in workshop number three. Um, hi. Well, first, uh, it's an amazing opportunity to be in this event. I have just moved to Berlin two weeks ago, and I'm a PhD researcher, and my current topic of research is reuse and repair in smart city projects. And uh, I guess the main focus of what I'm doing right now in my research is understanding whether uh, inverting whatever is said about waste in smart cities can be a way forward because whenever you see discussions about waste in smart cities is always about improving the efficiency of waste collection and recycling incineration or sending to landfills even though there is a well-known fact that waste prevention has a better impact uh, both in society and in environment. But there is very little being done by way of promoting more reuse of materials uh, in cities in general and particularly in smart city projects. So what we were discussing upstairs was uh, 
the feasibility and the, the validity of understanding reuse as something that can uh, be uh, be fed with data and then this data be used to decision making in smart city projects. Uh, whenever you see the discussions and decisions that are made by uh, both IT companies that offer services to cities and uh, by city officials, they are really uh, they are often based in data about waste production, but very little about uh, reuse of materials. So we were discussing uh, what is done to things in the city, particularly in Berlin, but also in other places, and what kinds of operations could be done in order to understand uh, the potential wealth of those objects that circulate in the city and how we can create technological or uh, structured solutions to make the best use of that, uh, of those materials. And then we explored uh, some possibilities. We had some discussions regarding value, regarding uh, how things happen in the city, what are the cultural aspects of reusing objects, and uh, how can that influence decision making. And uh, another outcome, I guess, of the discussion is that there were some very interesting initiatives that happened in the city and not all of the participants were aware of them. So we were discussing how to uh, find out and learn and how to find uh, who you can trust to repair stuff and where you can get stuff and, 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 and other discussions around it. So that's it for now. Thanks. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. Then I think let's move to workshop number one. I was also going to show something on the screen, which is quite impressive that you managed to complete some data visualizations in just two and a half hours. Yeah, so um, I'm Salvatore, I'm a social psychologist, and uh, um, I'm part of Tracking Exposed research team. And um, we, um, in our workshop, basically, we learn how to install tracking exposed uh, extension for YouTube and uh, we uh, learn how to use it and how to um, extract data from, from the, um, about YouTube algorithm and personalizations. And um, we made uh, in the last 10 minutes really a, a short test um, that I can maybe show you. Um, wait. So, um, this is um, five of us watching, uh, searching on YouTube the word Berlin. So, you can see that uh, this spot, red, um, green spot, are five users, right? And the pink spots, uh, pink nodes, are the suggested videos. So, we can see this, that just four videos were suggested to fi uh, the five of us. Um, and a lot of video was suggested just once to, to one specific user. And this is a, a clear example on um, how um, also uh, YouTube algorithm can shape the idea of a city um, and can um, create different filter bubbles um, uh, around different users and giving them a different idea of, of the city, for example, or f uh, of a place, or uh, of um, a topic. So uh, this is really a quick visualization that should be better and so on, but um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting that, for example, if we watch the title of the suggested video, Ber Berlin Vacation Travel Guide and uh, Worst Tourist Trap in Berlin were suggested to all the users, but for example, um, um, Metallica song and um, um, other kind of uh, video with other kind of perspective about the city were suggested just to two users. So this is a um, really quick uh, kind of experiment we can make to, to see the filter bubbles around a theme, a word, for example Berlin, and uh, the, the, the aim of the workshop was to try to understand and learn a methodology to see uh, how algorithmic uh, personalization shape our idea 
about in this case of a city. Awesome, that's really great to see, super. Um, then moving on to workshop number two, there was the visualization workshop with River Honer on critical mapping. Yes, so um, we started our workshop with an introduction to geospatial data analysis techniques and um, with uh, visualizing geospatial data, for example, GeoJSON and um, some of the kind of basic aspects of uh, mapping with regards to like specifically um, critical mapping, which is a subject I talked about on Friday. Um, so basically points, lines, and polygons and how those relate to mapping the incidence of ticket controllers on the Berlin Transit Network so that we could kind of have some basis to consider where to go with um, the remaining time where we kind of had two tracks that we followed. One, um, one kind of group was focusing on making an app that could be used for um, basically helping people avoid the ticket controllers on the U-Bahn network. And um, one idea we had for that was to improve our data collection by um, having a button that you press when you <laughs> witness the reporters. Um, we also talked about like with this increased amount of data and hopefully better quality data, what would we want to visualize to help people? So we talked about real-time warnings. Um, one thing we talked about was like warning people when they leave the AB zone to the <laughs> airport, for example. And it kind of led us to wonder um, if this is the kind of problem that we could, if we were to solve with software, would it uh, be better to solve it with purely data-driven solutions or also with like assumptions because many of us know the city and know we could probably make assumptions about what we think the behavior of uh, ticket controllers are. Um, we also talked about like data challenges and one interesting idea was to consider uh, if we could get this data, what wagon the ticket controllers come in <laughs> and um, also we're interested in the salary of the people who get fined um, so that perhaps to build a kind of argument that this is disproportionately the issue of um, ticket control is disproportionately affecting uh, people in like precarious social situations. So the other kind of track that we went down was um, as people were starting to think about a possible app solution they were started to question their own assumptions um, which I wish more people would do when they think about making apps and they decided to, they kind of started to ask, um, think about the effects that the privatization or at least the criminalization of unpaid uh, transit usage would cause, um, how it's the class inequity of this issue, about um, how it's more unfair for undocumented people. And they talked about transit as a right. And um, we also, um, yeah, we, they, they also started to wonder about who are the controllers themselves and thought about what would be an interesting research uh, in that way. And it was mostly to phrase a policy per, um, position, basically. Um, yeah, and in the end, we thought of basically, it was just a nice time kind of pondering on the subject, thinking about practical solutions, but also the political context in which we would want to make these um, practical applications. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. And I think there's also still the map and some sheets hanging there in the corner if people want to check it later. Um, yeah, and then the final workshop was also upstairs here with Elisabeth calderon Luning. So you want to report back on what happened. There was the workshop also going on to the longest, I think, because people kept discussing quite a lot in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, we, um, the, the name of the workshop is uh, citizen manifest on data cities and uh, we a little bit left the manifest part away because um, when we speak about data cities it's very as, as as with any kind of technology it's very easy to get stuck at the technological level and uh, when we're talking about digital cities then we're getting stuck at the problems that technology might or might not um, resolve so we were trying to move to, uh, past that to look at uh, value systems that we need for a city uh, in the upcoming future and um, to try to build this kind of a, an idea of an, a manifesto more from the desires up and not from the problems up. 
So a um, way that we uh, try doing this, although it's uh, very difficult, I think because we are constantly being fed an idea of future through, through what we're living uh, today, uh, it's very difficult to break through the dystopian uh, view that we have of future. But we try to, um, to go outside and say, when we leave this building, we're now in the city of um, 2045, so 25 years from now, and to see what, what would be aspects that we really want our cities to be and, and so on. And in that exercise, it became so evident how, how prolific these narratives are that we just feel like it's very difficult to, to go forward and have any kind of other view of the world. So from there we went to the idea of trying to manifest the manifesto, so looking at what kind of projects and um, activities can we start right now to, to start to push towards another direction that goes um, towards other economic models, uh, other ways of organizing our, our collective togetherness uh, that are not based on uh, uh, capitalist gain, profit, um, ownership, but on other models of, of self-organization um, uh, self and autonomy. And uh, we ended up, and that's why uh, we spent so much time um, to collecting resources because we, we are feeling that this is also like a social health problem that we are feeling very alone a lot in these uh, and getting stuck in these dystopias. So we were just collecting resources of everything positive that we know, all of the spaces that we are um, that we want to share with each other and also of the political engagements that are happening um, to be able to connect to those. And, um, and we, I hope we stay in contact too because we've exchanged emails as well. Yeah, great, really nice. So yeah, we're kind of coming to the end of our conference but also want to open up the space if there's anyone from the workshops that wants to add their comment or if anybody still has a final question for somebody, I would say now is the time or we're all tired after a long day of workshops, that's also very possible. <laughs> yeah, then I would just like to thank again all four of you because it was really an amazing first time actually that we did such a community workshops day and it was a very interesting content from all of the workshops and also how it manages to connect all to our conference topic. So I think it was a really amazing day. So many thanks again for, for being workshop uh, leader today and it was really a great day. Thank you. So you can also leave the stage, then we will do the final wrap up of the conference. And <laughs> so yeah, now we're finally at that time after our actually almost not even three days, but almost four days event, because we started on Thursday with the screening. So before we finally wrap up, we just want to say a little bit about the events that are going to happen in the future with the Disruption Network Lab. So our next conference, we are planning for the end of November, the 26, uh, sorry, 27, 28 and 29th of November. And it will again be happening here at Studio One Batanian. And the topic will be borders of fear, migration, security and control. So we want to address uh, the topic of human rights violations that are often happening in the context of migration and especially focusing on uh, borders, both on a concrete level. So of course, closure of frontiers, uh, creation of refugee camps, and also security issues uh, surrounding borders. But also speaking of uh, borders as a strategy of cultural violence, which is often happening as part of right-wing propaganda and the push for increased nationalism nowadays. So again, this conference will be happening on Friday and Saturday and we do a closing community day on the Sunday. And on this day, we connect again to the work of diverse activists and initiatives around uh, the topic. Um, but before we go on to the borders topic, we have a final Data Cities meetup. So we are meeting again for our community program on the 7th of October at State Studio. This is in Berlin, Schöneberg. And there we are going to address the topic of facial recognition data sets. So we invited artist and researcher Adam Harvey and we're going to uh, explore facial recognition data sets with him 
also from his work on the project Megapixels. Um, and we hope to understand more about where this data comes from and who is using it and for what purpose. And there's still some seats left, so if you're interested, please join us and you can register online. It's also free to attend. Um, yeah, and then all that's left is to say a final thanks to also our amazing team that helped to make all of this happen. So first of all, of course, thank you Tatiana Bazzichelli for the curation of this amazing event and the co-curator also Mauro Mondello that was not anymore with the streaming now because we're not on streaming, but he's been following all the event as well. Uh, and then also thanks to Nada Baker for running the community program together with me and uh, coming up with the whole concept of this first workshops day. Uh, and then again, thanks also to Nada Baker, Elena Vojanovska and Monty Harmony for being in the production team. Uh, thanks to Jonas Franke, the designer, and Steph Lenk for the communication work. Uh, also, thanks to our video crew, so Gonzalo, Gabriel, and Angel that were with us for all these days. And of course, although we left now, a big thanks to Rana who did our live streaming. Um, we also want to thank Ricardo Bernardi, who did our amazing photography these days. And Elisabeth Enke, Francesco Mancori, and Thorsten Utken, the technology support team. Uh, then a final thanks also to Kim, who helped us with assistant event management and the cash desk and Jasper and Guillermo that will be helping us also to, to wrap everything up from this conference and doing the takedown. So yeah, thanks a lot everybody and we hope to see you again at future events.